Hello and let's talk about secularism. Now, according to the preamble to the constitution, India is a sovereign, socialist, secular and democratic republic. However, a few days ago, Maharashtra Governor Bhagat Singh Koshyari sent a letter to Chief Minister Uddhav Thakre about temples not being opened due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. In the letter, he wondered if the Maharashtra CM had turned secular, a term which Uddhav Thakre, according to the governor, used to hate. Of course, the Maharashtra CM replied with an equally scathing letter claiming that he did not need a certificate in Hindutva from the governor. These barbs aside, what does it mean for the country when secularism is used as a taunt? We have seen this all around us, the eye rolling when secularism is mentioned, the abusive way in which the word pseudo-secular has been used. And now we have a constitutional functionary using the word in a way that makes it seem like secularism is not really a value to be cherished. What does it say about the polity? and the state of our institutions. We talked to senior journalist Paranjay Guha Thakurta on this issue. Thank you, Paranjay, for joining us. So we have seen the governor of the state, state of Maharashtra, Bhagat Singh Koshyari, write this letter. And this letter is a lot of media organi organizations have also already pointed out, experts have pointed out there are various aspects which are problematic. But to start with the most significant issue here seems to be his question to Chief Minister Uddhav Thakre as to whether he has turned secular which, uh, of course, the tone is one thing, but uh, the sheer question itself kind of is uh, sparks disbelief because it seems like being secular is something of a crime. It's something of a something that is uh, de deviant or something like that. So what do you have to say to this? Prashant, uh, this is really ab absolutely amazing. The kind of unsolicited advice that the governor of Maharashtra, Bhagat Singh Koshyari, gave to the chief minister of Maharashtra. And you see, both of them are constitutional authorities. That's the first point. The most uh, controversial sentence in that letter that he wrote, which is that now in, it's in the public domain. I mean, again, these letters, whether they, I mean, who, who put it out in the public domain is another issue. But dripping with sarcasm, Governor Koshyari wrote, that he was wondering whether the chief minister has received any sort of a divine premonition to keep postponing the reopening of religious places in Mumbai, in Maharashtra, and then wondered whether he turned secular himself. And he said this is a term that he hated. Now, the point is, if you look at the facts, Maharashtra has among different states in the country, it has the maximum cases, cases of COVID-19. Uh, over one, one and a half million cases, over 40,000 deaths. Health, law and order is a state subject. Technically, the governor is bound by the advice of the Council of Ministers. But whether it be in Maharashtra, whether it be in Kerala, whether it be in Bengal, the governors who have been appointed by the Bharti Janta Party are acting as if they are political personalities, not constitutional authorities. In fact, this was pointed out not just by Uddhav Thakre himself, that, that Governor uh, Koshyari had sworn by the constitution of the country, which, told, which mentions the word secular, and, 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 and the, the head of the, the Nationalist uh, Congress Party, Sharad Pawar, too, uh, has written to the prime minister objecting to the to to, to all, all that he's written. Now behind all this is politics. Governor Koshyari was literally made a fool of when he had sworn Devendra Fadnavis and Ajit Pawar early in the morning, and the whole political equation changed. Now, if you step back and see the the photographer's son, the Thakre's cartoonist father, Balasab Thakre, was a hardcore right-wing pro-Hindu political personality. You can't say the same thing about his son, but Balasab Thakre was a different guy. I mean, he uh, publicly welcomed uh, the fact that some of his supporters had uh, demolished the Babri Masjid. I mean, when the anti-Muslim riots took place in Mumbai, in, in, in 92 and 93, uh, the Sri Krishna Commission report clearly pointed out the, the complicity of the Shiv Sena in those riots. 
But let's move ahead and let's see Uddhav Thakre. Uddhav Thakre talks on the, says on the floor of the assembly that one should not mix religion with politics. Now, they are obviously very, very unhappy about the fact that they've been denied this opportunity. The Shiv Sena and the BJP were together before the elections and then they lost out because of the Thakre switch sides. Now, we have to also know that local elections are going to take place. Now, after having taken charge as chief minister, yes, uh, Bhagat Singh Koshari reminds uh, Uddhav Thakre that you've been a strong votary of Hindutva. You had publicly espoused your devotion to Lord Ram by visiting Ayodhya after taking over charge as chief minister. All of this is saw grapes. Now, it's, it's sort of competitive Hindutva that is in place. Exactly. The same Governor Koshyari welcomes actor Kangana Ranaut when she could describe Maharashtra, compares Maharashtra to Pakistan occupied Kashmir. So, what we are seeing is competitive, you know, uh, sort of right wing Hindutva. And, and I, I dare say, uh, the uh, the unsolicited advice that has been given by Governor Bhagat Singh Koshyari indicates, I mean, how even today the Bharatiya Janata Party has not been reconciled to the fact that uh, there was, I mean, I mean, I mean they, that they failed in their uh, attempt to form a government in Maharashtra, which is uh, uh, one of India's very large and highly industrialized state uh, the, is the capital of Maharashtra is Mumbai, often described as India's financial capital, that they have lost out. I think it's still hurting Governor Bhagat Singh Koshyari, who's acting more as a functionary of the Bharatiya Janata Party than as a constitutional authority, which he is. Absolutely. And in this context, it's also maybe interesting to look at uh, the aspect on which much of, like you said, the sour grapes is focused on, that is secularism itself. And we've already seen how much in public culture secularism is today denigrated. I mean, pseudo-secular has almost become uh, a commonplace in popular discourse, so to speak, on, on WhatsApp, among families, on media channels, of course. And now we have a constitutional functionary, like you said, uh, say, seemingly in his letter, which is again sarcastic, almost making it seem like it's something that is out of the ordinary. So these kind of small, small, these, this letter may be in the larger scheme of things is nothing. It gets forgotten two weeks down the line, but it also sends a message in some ways about how uh, secularism itself is being perceived and its value in the Indian constitution. You mentioned the phrase pseudo-secularism. Uh, this was used by Lal Krishna Advani. Exactly. <laughs> you know, but the point is today, the crisis is deeper. Because what you're seeing is that the very, the, the constitution of India, it's itself under attack. And, and there is talk, there is, there is need to remove two words from the preamble, which is secularism and socialism. The point is, the Narendra Modi government clearly by its actions are, I mean, they, are, they have indicated in the past and continue to indicate how little they really care for institutions and how little they care for say the parliament, the manner in which the last parliament session took place. The, the, I and mean, if you compare uh, the track record of the Narendra Modi government, the last six years, the two governments, with the way parliament has been functioning. It's not to just mention various other institutions of the state, whether it be the judiciary, whether it be bodies like the election commission of India, uh, uh, law enforcing agencies like the, the, the Central Bureau of Investigation, the judiciary, the media, all these institutions have been not just compromised and weakened, they've been populated with individuals who espouse a certain ideological position, which is not just pro-Hindu, but more often than not, Islamophobic. And this is the culture that is being uh, sought to be propagated by the ruling dis dispensation and the supporters of the ruling dispensation. So what you are seeing, this kind of unseemly spat and exchange of letters between the governor of Maharashtra and the, the, the chief minister of Maharashtra is really a manifestation of 
how the Bharti Janta Party, its ideological parent, the Rashtriya Swam Sevak Sangh, and the rulers of India today, how they are seeking to not just demonize the seventh of the population, but what, uh, how, what, what they actually are, I mean, they, they complete disregard for secularism any which way you choose to interpret this term. Thank you so much, Paranjay, for talking to us. Thank you. Our next segment is part of a conversation between NewsClicks Prabir Purkayasa and immunologist Dr. Satyajit Rath. They discuss monoclonal antibody therapy, which was given to US President Donald Trump after he contracted COVID-19. Dr. Rath explains his treatment and its positives and negatives. Right now, of course, the news is the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, not a cocktail, but two antibody, monoclonal antibodies seem to have been given to Trump in a mixture. And Trump claims this is amazingly good, that he's almost fully recovered. And he's also pushing that it be now uh, allowed for under emergency use provisions, which earlier he had, sub he had proposed or he had advocated for uh, hydroxychloroquine. And what else was it apart from bleach, which of course he didn't really ask for emergency authorization. But uh, also he, had, he, had pushed, he had pushed remdesivir, he had pushed plasma therapy. Do you think this monoclonal antibodies, the Regeneron variety, of course, which has given a huge boost to their stock, is actually something which is worth considering at this stage? That this is something really which has more positive elements to it from whatever reports we are getting, and not from Mr. Trump, but from uh, whatever other reports that are available. And it could be something which could be used. Yeah, so um, it's interesting in a variety of ways, this monoclonal antibody cocktail therapy um, that's under trial and that uh, Mr. Trump has gotten as a matter of uh, um, Compassionate usage authorization. Um, compassionate usage presupposes that one is feeling sorry for uh, the ill person. So um, let's let's go one step back and remind ourselves that for a long time, not simply Mr. Trump and his uh, um, uh, fantasy bandwagon. But a lot of people across the world, including in India, were very hopeful about plasma therapy. Right. And the and principle that still is being used in different parts of the world, including India. And in India, we had politicians uh, exhorting uh, people who had recovered to donate plasma and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, now, let me offer a little bit of arithmetic in this. The amount of plasma being given in plasma therapy was about 200 milliliters. Okay. 200 milliliters of plasma is on average about 4 grams of antibody protein. Okay. But keep in mind that of the total amount of antibody protein that any one of us has, has circulating at any time, certainly no more than about 1% will be against a given target. Okay. That means amongst the antibodies, the, which is your currently what the disease or infection you may, you may be having, only a small fraction of the total antibodies, only that small fraction will be against the specific disease. Correct. So, I think it's about 1%. So, out of 4 grams, you are really talking about really 0 0.04 grams. Correct. So, now consider that unlike plasma therapy, the monoclonal antibody therapy that Mr. Trump has gotten has a two dose regimen a high dose and a low dose. He, of course, being the leader of the free world, got a high dose regimen. So the high dose regimen is eight grams. The low dose regimen is four grams. Okay. What this is saying 
is that in the low dose regimen, four grams of monoclonal antibody is injected into the individual. Now, unlike plasma therapy, here is the arithmetic. When you do plasma therapy, you are transferring 40 milligrams of antibody. When you do monoclonal antibody therapy, you're transferring four grams of SARS-CoV-2 specific antibody. That's 100 times more. So effectively, monoclonal therapy is giving 100 times the amount of antiviral antibody as plasma therapy has been giving. Okay. Now, so that concentrated antibody that you are getting, getting to replace, really help your body antibodies to fight the disease. No. So effectively, the antibodies that you're getting are substituting for your antibodies. They are not actually helping your antibodies do anything. Okay. They are simply functioning to neutralize virus particles binding to target cells. And if that happens, the virus life cycle is interrupted. And if the virus life cycle is interrupted, virus growth is prevented. And that helps you get better. So what Regeneron, the company has done, is taken not one, but two monoclonal antibodies, both of which block virus particle binding to the cell surface. And the amounts that are being given are huge. Not only are the amounts huge, they are therefore being given as a slow intravenous drip. So here's the problem. What we are talking about is an extraordinarily expensive medication. Okay. Because such very large amounts have to be given. Consider the manufacturing and the supply chain difficulties that will arise for one dose to be of four grams or quite possibly eight grams. That's one problem. The second problem is, as I said, intravenous drip. So it, has on, it can only be given in a hospital. hospital. The third issue is, we've been saying now for the past six months that for all viral diseases, antiviral medications have the most clinical effect early during infection. As a result, what we are saying is that the Regencov2, which is what this medication is apparently called, although Mr. Trump seems to think that it's called Regeneron, um, That's but, a company, right? which is the company, but this monoclonal medication, where would it be best? So let me point out to you where it would work supremely well. It would work beautifully as a prophylactic, as a preventive in people who are going to be very high risk exposed, such as first responders, such as healthcare workers, not simply physicians, healthcare workers, including physicians, nurses, nursing aides, ambulance drivers, um, mortuary, hearse drivers, and so on and so forth. In them, a single injection might quite conceivably provide them with very strong protection for a couple of weeks or even up to a month. But the trouble with that is they can't just take a shot and go to work. They have to go into hospital, get an intravenous drip. All of this, therefore, is to underline the fact that none of this None of these are easy solutions. Okay. There are interesting technological possibilities, but there are daunting real life difficulties with all of this. None of this, of course, does the current president of the United States understand in any nuanced fashion, but nuance has uh, never had any passing acquaintance apparently with Mr. Trump. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from the country and the world. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.